Okay. And now we're going to go live. I think that should be working. We are live. Okay. Wonderful. Um, I'm just going to wait for that to confirm that we're live. Wonderful. Okay. That should be working great. Um, hello, everyone. Um, good morning. Uh, for me, it's it certainly is a kind of morning. Um, for, uh, for some of you, maybe it's afternoon, maybe it's evening. Um, wherever you are, thank you for joining us. Uh, we are here for the OAO AWB um, a Smartphone Astrophotography Workshop. Um, my name is Kelly Blumenthal. I am the Deputy Director of the IEU Office for Astronomy Outreach, and we're so excited to have you here today um, to join us uh, in this workshop. Um, so I would like to say that this workshop was actually collaboratively created. It was built by a group of astrophotographers and astronomy communicators. Um, and personally, I'm just so glad that I had the opportunity to work with these folks. Um, I've learned so much from them in the last six weeks, and I'm sure that in the next couple hours, you'll learn a whole lot from them too. Um, but before we get into the workshop, I'd like to give some context uh, and maybe a bit of an astronomical primer, just to help you really understand the context and the content behind what we're talking about today. So first, of course, we at the IU Office for Astronomy Outreach are celebrating dark and quiet skies um, during the month of May. Um, this is a global project uh, aimed at raising awareness uh, about the need to preserve dark and quiet skies. Now, these two elements, this dark and quiet, they go hand in hand, but they're not necessarily the same. Um, on the one hand, we have dark, squi dark sky protection, um, which arises from light pollution abatement policy and law um, and activism across the electromagnetic spectrum, so not just visible light pollution. Um, and then the other part of this is quiet sky protection, which refers to the threat posed by satellite constellation interference. Um, now, through this project, we hope that people will learn um, about the importance of uh, dark and quiet skies for human culture, for human heritage and health, um, and also the health of our ecosystems. Um, and of course, the importance of dark and quiet skies for astronomy research and of course for astrophotography. Um, now for astrophotography, both looking at the images and the act of taking photos um, of the night sky gives us a really unique perspective on the need for dark and quiet sky preservation. Um, artificial lights can drown out the dark sky that we're often trying to capture. Um, and it makes it really difficult to accurately represent the true night sky. Um, satellites too can zoom across an image and really ruin the uh, photo that you're trying to take. So with all of these competing factors, it can be difficult to find a true um, unobscured view of the night sky. But having these dark sky experiences and in turn experiencing feelings of awe um, and wonder, curiosity, can have a huge impact on our mental well-being. Um, and actually that's been demonstrated by the IEU Office of Astronomy for Development and their flagship uh, program on astronomy for mental health. Um, now in my discussions with experts that helped to create this workshop, one of whom is here today with us, um, we decided that the first thing everyone should know before doing any kind of astrophotography are some fundamentals of the observational astronomy. Um, now, I'm sure many of you are very well versed um, in this topic, so please, you know, feel free to go grab a glass of water, come back in five minutes, um, and you'll be right back on track. Um, this is just to get everybody more or less on the same page. Um, so, very quickly, uh, the sun rises in the east um, in the morning and sets due west in the evening. Um, now, a weather app on your phone will tell you when sunrise and sunset are each day so you can plan your photo shoot accordingly. Um, the moon is another important object in our sky, uh, not just during nighttime, but sometimes during the day as well. Um, the moon has an irregular surface with mare, or dark oceans of ancient lava flows and bright mountains that we call highlands. Um, it does not produce its own light, but rather reflects sunlight uh, back to us um, at Earth. Um, and the amount of reflected sunlight ranges from about 5 to 20%, depending on the region that we're looking at. Um, and this might not seem like a lot, 
but it can actually really impact the photo that you're trying to take, um, particularly if you're trying to capture low light objects like the image uh, that you can see in my background, if you can see me. Um, so for that reason, actually, it's really important to know about this, the lunar cycle. Um, the cycle lasts about 30 days uh, from when the moon is in its new phase or when the moon is positioned between the Earth and the sun um, to when it's in its full, when the Earth is between the moon and the sun. Um, and then back again to the new phase. Um, notice that all of these images were taken at night, um, but the moon can be seen actually during the day as well, um, as evidenced by some of the photos that I showed in the last slide. Um, now, it's good to know uh, the phase of the moon in addition to when it rises and sets, and you can find all of this information very, very easily for your location um, uh, on the internet um, and, the, and the, time of, uh, the time of year, I should say. Um, now, the planets, uh, the moon and the sun appear in our sky um, on or near um, a line that's called the ecliptic. Um, this corresponds to the average plane of our solar, solar system. Um, whether or not they're visible in our night sky depends on where these planets are um, in their orbit around the sun with respect to ours. Um, typically, the brightest planets are Mercury, Venus, uh, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, although occasionally we can see uh, Uranus and Neptune um, if you have kind of dark sky conditions uh, with the help of binoculars or a small telescope. Um, now, Mercury is often very close to the sun, uh, which kind of makes it difficult to spot. Um, Venus is, of course, very bright um, and is only typically for, uh, visible un, um, until shortly after sunset and uh, in the early morning just before dawn. Um, now, Mars is a orange reddish color and is most interesting to look at when it's in opposition. Um, and that's when the uh, two planets, Earth and Mars, are closest to one another. Um, now, Jupiter is very easy to spot. Um, many of you probably see Jupiter regularly. Um, Perhaps also with its moons that you can also sometimes see uh, nearby, sometimes with the naked eye, um, if you have good eyes. <laughs> uh, and then finally, Saturn might look kind of oblong uh, to the naked eye, but through binoculars or again, a small telescope, its rings are really highly visible and I think truly awe-inspiring. So all of these phenomena occur in our night sky um, because the Earth uh, and all the other planets are orbiting the sun, um, and in turn, the moon is orbiting the Earth. Uh, this impacts the um, exact direction of sunrise and sunset, um, when that also depends on where you are with respect to the equator, um, uh, where the moon is in the night sky, and of course, it'll also, uh, the, um, the tilt of the Earth um, will impact the seasons uh, that you're experiencing and the weather patterns that you have on Earth as well. So as I said, all of the planets in our solar system orbit the sun, um, and the relative positions of those planets to us here on Earth will change where they appear in our night sky. Um, as we go around the sun throughout the year, uh, the constellations we see can change. Um, and as we move in our orbit, uh, we encounter various clusters of meteoroids uh, that we see as meteor showers in our night sky. Now, there are several free apps uh, that you can use to help you observe the night sky. Stellarium uh, is freely available for Mac and PC um, and as an app for Android phones. Now, this is an incredibly powerful piece of um, home uh, planetarium software and one that I use uh, very regularly uh, uh, when I'm trying to figure out where something is uh, going to be in the night sky. Um, for your phone, uh, there's a sky map for Android, a night sky for, uh, for iPhones, and a sky tonight for Android and iPhone as well. Um, now, these apps will be incredibly helpful as you plan your astrophot astrophotography expedition. Uh, but just know that these are just a handful of what's out there. There are probably hundreds of apps that you can choose from, uh, each with their own unique set of features. Um, so it's just important to uh, find the one that works best for you. Um, it, there's, there's really no best choice. It's probably just a personal decision for yourself. Um, so now that I've given you a little bit of an introduction, uh, we'll dive right into our session with uh, uh, Sten Omo, um, our expert for this uh, afternoon, or this uh, for today, 
we'll just we'll just say today. Um, when he's done, uh, we'll take a 10 minute break. Um, so you can all take some time to uh, digest the information uh, that you've just heard um, and then come back uh, with your questions. Um, and then once you're all out of questions, uh, we'll summarize this and conclude today's event. Um, so before I hand it over uh, to our smartphone astrophotography expert, I'd like to just quickly introduce him. Uh, Sten Oldenwald is an ast astronomer uh, with the NASTRA Heliophysics Education Activation Group at the Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, Center excuse me. Um, he received his PhD in astronomy in 1982 um, and has been active in astronomy education for almost all of that time. Um, currently, he's the director of Space Math at NASA, which I think is the coolest name of all time. Uh, and he actually wrote a book on smartphone astro astrophotography that is quite extensive. Um, so with that, I will hand it over, um, stop sharing my screen so that we can uh, hear from Sten. Okay. Oh, um, okay, let's see. Um, okay, well, I guess, I guess I'll share it this way. I mean, you, you can see all of the, all of the pages as they, as they arrive. Um, well, okay, uh, it's a pretty big task to try to really get a handle on smartphone astrophotography, but the, the most important thing is that you really need to understand your, your smartphone uh, extremely well. Um, you, you know, you, it's, it's not going to be the same kind of photography that you normally have, you know, during the daytime when you're photographing <laughs> common objects. I mean, you're, you're going to be photographing things that are mostly at very low light levels. So there's a whole process that you have to sort of understand uh, in order to make that experience successful. Um, basically, a smartphone camera is uh, similar to other cameras that uh, you've heard about, digital cameras. They, they have lenses, they have filters, uh, and for digital cameras, they have a digital sensor, which is an array of pixels that are sensitive to light. Um, they also have filters, uh, red, blue, green filters, in order to give you all the other colors that uh, are common to most types of photography. Uh, for the native camera that you get with your smartphone or the ones that you buy, you basically have control of the um, exposure speed, uh, the light sensitivity of the camera. Uh, you can control the zoom. Uh, this is generally called digital zoom uh, because your optical lenses don't move, which is what they normally do when you have an you know, a, a typical normal camera. Uh, in a normal camera, the lenses actually move back and forth along the axis of the, of the optical axis of the camera, and that's what causes the zoom effect. Um, with uh, smartphone cameras, the uh, lens is fixed in the case, and uh, all that you're able to do is sort of uh, electronically magnify the image uh, to reveal, you know, more pixels. And sometimes that, that works well. You can enlarge normal scenery and not see any of the pixelation. But if you use too much digital zoom, you'll start to see the actual pixelization of the image. That's not what you want to do in astronomy. So even though it's tempting to really zoom in on the moon, it's probably best not to overdo it. Uh, otherwise, the image of the moon will start breaking up into pixels. Well, anyway. Um, uh, beyond that, uh, what you see when you actually open your camera for the first time uh, is going to be, it's going to depend really on the particular camera application that's running on your smartphone. Uh, typically, you'll have a main screen, which will show what the current image is. You might have some controls of the exposure speed, uh, the film speed, the ISO number, as it's called. Um, the focus and the white balance. Uh, but some applications may not even have that. So what you're going to have to do uh, is to search in your application store 
uh, for a camera app that allows some kind of functionality that involves uh, manual setting of uh, exposure speed, uh, film speed and white balance and focus and things like that. Cameras today, you know, they, they want to do everything and not have you do a whole lot. So they do autofocus, they do, you know, exposure speed and ISO automatically. So you never actually see any of that behind the scenes. <laughs> uh, which if you want to do astrophotography, you have to have access to all of those functions in order to get the nicest image. Uh, focus, as I said, uh, the way that that's handled uh, depends on your smartphone, but preferably you want to have a camera app that allows you to manually focus uh, and get the best clarity on your image. Uh, the image that you see on the left here shows uh, an auto-focused image, and the one on the right shows one that's not been focused yet, but that you can focus using a manual setting. Uh, the way that you typically do this is you, uh, for conventional photography, is you look at some foreground object, preferably a light source like a street lamp or, or something like that, uh, headlight of a car, uh, porch light from a house, and then you try to get that light as sharply focused as you can. Uh, you want the thing that you're focusing on to be uh, more than you know, 20 to 30 feet away so that you're essentially focusing at infinity. Uh, so that's, that's what you wanna do when you're doing astrophotography. You wanna be focused at infinity and not focused on something in sort of the foreground of the, of the camera. Um, and as I said, it, it really depends on, on the camera. Some of them uh, allow you to you know, manually focus the, uh, the image by tapping on the screen. Uh, it produces a box, and then within that box, it'll, you know, let you focus on on something that's within that reference box. Uh, or there'll be a scrollable uh, bar at the bottom or side of the image uh, that lets you move it up and down and change the focus that way. Uh, you have to experiment, and that's why I'm saying it, it, it's important that you really understand how your particular camera works and to experiment with it in a lot of different settings. Um, so is, is an interesting concept, uh, way back when dinosaurs ruled the earth, uh, we had film cameras that used celluloid film and, uh, the films were designed to be more or less responsive to light called the quantum efficiency. Uh, this was characterized by something called the ASA number, uh, and generally, uh, color films that were available in the 60s and 70s that commonly were used had ASA numbers of about 50 to 100. Uh, if you were photographing under sort of dim conditions, uh, there were films that uh, had ASAs of 400 to up to a couple of thousand. ISO is the same kind of a concept. Um, it's basically the, the amplification well, here's how it works. A, a photon of light comes in and strikes the pixel and it releases electrons into the well of the pixel. And the more light you have coming in, the more of these photoelectrons fill up the well and the brighter the well becomes as a contributor to your image up to the point where the well fills up completely with electrons, in which case you have what's called saturation and the pixel becomes completely white. Um, you can have that effect if you use your smartphone cameras with a very high ISO setting and you photograph a daylight scene. It'll completely swamp the image and turn it completely white because the pixels are completely flooded with photoelectrons up to their maximum capacity. What you want to do, however, is for astrophotography, because it is involving faint objects, is you want to have that ISO number set somewhere in the 500 to 1000 range, uh, that provides suitable image amplification uh, for the typical ranges of exposures you're gonna be using. For example, these two pictures on the right here were taken at the same ISO number, 400, or at two different ISO numbers for the same exposure speed, two seconds. Uh, everything else was the same, and you see that uh, for a low ISO number, you'll get basically a dark sky. 
you also won't get very many stars. <laughs> and for the very fast high ISO example, you'll get a very bright looking sky and you'll probably get quite a few more stars uh, in your field. But the problem with the fast ISO is that uh, if you have any kind of light pollution at all, uh, the light pollution will turn your dark image into something that looks like the thing on the right. And that under certain conditions can be very pretty depending on what your foreground objects are and how you're framing the image. Maybe that's a, an artistically interesting thing to do. Uh, you need to experiment with that. You know, if you're really interested in the dark sky effect, uh, you're going to be running with a, a lower ISO number and a longer exposure speed in order to get more stars, but still preserve the dark sky background. <clears throat> uh, here's an example of uh, a, a longer exposure at 25 seconds at an ISO of 6400. So under these conditions, these were dark sky conditions. And here you can see, you know, thousands of stars and you can see a meteor. Uh, you can even see in the upper top there, you can see a star cluster nebula. I'm not quite sure which one that is. Uh, so ISO can be very, very useful if you have really good dark sky conditions. It can really pull out stars and let you see a lot of stars in the sky. But, you know, even so, you have to be careful that towards the horizon, you don't get flooded by a lot of light pollution from a distant city. So there's a balance there, uh, which again, it, it might artistically be valid for you to see a, a distant city with the faint Milky Way stars above it. Uh, that, that's a completely valid thing. I'm not saying that it's, it's a bad thing to do. I'm just saying that it depends on what your artistic interest is in, in setting up and formatting your image. Uh, exposure time goes along with ISO uh, and it's complicated. And basically for any photo that you take, you have to experiment uh, by selecting ISO numbers and by selecting exposure times and see which combination, which pairing uh, gives you the best artistic effect in your final product. Uh, it is very complicated. Uh, some, co some cameras now handle that under the rubric of, you know, faint light photography. Uh, they will automatically adjust the exposure time and ISO to get the best possible image that their artificial intelligence program uh, says uh, is possible from that combination. Um, it, exposure time is, is, is simply what it says, is simply the amount of time that the lens of your smartphone camera remains open and those photons strike the, uh, the detector, the uh, photo sensor and fill up the wells, uh, the pixel wells with the uh, photo electrons. Um, generally, you want the, the wells to be about a third full. Uh, that reduces the amount of graininess that you will see. Uh, anything lower than that, and you'll start to see what's called shot noise, which is the random arrival of photons uh, into the pixel. Uh, and that can cause uh, the, the dark sky that you're trying to photograph start taking on a kind of a mottled grainy appearance, uh, even though you might be shooting under fairly dark conditions. Um, here's an example of uh, holding the ISO number fixed at 400 and changing the exposure time. Uh, you see that short exposures, you'll get a nice, lovely dark sky and you get a nice horizon with a kind of a rainbow <laughs> color. And at the far, far right, you're starting to saturate by uh, the, uh, the photo detectors, uh, certainly towards the horizon there where it's all white. Those pixels are all completely saturated and full. Uh, but you get this nice gradient effect uh, going up to the top where the sky remains dark. So again, depending on which one of these, these artistic effects you want, I mean, you need to balance the ISO number with the exposure speed. Um, the nice thing is you don't have to worry about the f-stop on your smartphone camera because it's all the same. You don't have any control over that at all. Um, here's, a, here's a nice combination showing uh, shooting at a very high ISO at 3200 and a long exposure of 30 seconds. And these are under really good dark sky conditions. And you can see the Milky Way and a very distant city 
on the right, you're shooting at a lower ISO number at only a couple of seconds. And uh, you, know, you see more familiar things in the foreground if you're trying to frame your shot. There's apparently a planetary conjunction going on in the sky. So that's kind of lovely. Um, and you'll get the shadows of some clouds uh, appearing, which is also nice. Um, uh, as I said, the f-stop on your smartphone camera is fixed uh, because mechanically you can't move the lens in and out or closer and farther from the photo, photo detectors. Uh, typically, they're at between 1.5 and, and 2.5 which uh, in sort of the old style of thinking about cameras uh, makes uh, uh, smartphone cameras fairly fast. Uh, that, that means that the lens is generally wide open or close to being wide open for the most part. Uh, it also means that uh, you know, if you're shooting things uh, conventionally, your so-called depth of field will be a bit shallower. Uh, but you know, the idea for smartphone cameras is that they want your photo experience to be as close to what your eye experiences. Uh, and basically your eye is roughly a F2 <laughs> instrument. <laughs> so smartphone cameras tend to be clustered around that as sort of a typical F-stop. Okay, white balance is a really cool thing. Uh, it has more to do with sort of the, the diffuse background light that you might have in your image. Uh, it's essentially a way of adjusting what's called the color temperature of the light uh, coming into your camera. Um, if you want a lot of blues in your colors, you shoot with a fairly low color temperature of about 2000 degrees Kelvin, white balance. If you want to see something that looks a bit hotter, then you will shoot with a white balance uh, you know, at 8,000 Kelvin. Uh, tungsten light typically is about uh, 6,000 or so Kelvin. Uh, sunlight is typically about uh, five to 6,000 Kelvin. Uh, if you shoot indoors under you know, very incandescent conditions, you'll get a lot of reddish hinges to things uh, because the, uh, the color temperature of the background light is, is fairly cool at three to 4,000 degrees. So white balance is something that you can play with. And as you can see in these uh, four images, it gives you a kind of a different artistic effect uh, to whatever the scene is that you're trying to frame and, and reproduce. Um, here's an example of the white balance adjustment uh, being applied to a uh, photograph of the Milky Way. Um, you can see at 4,000 degrees, uh, you get one kind of a color, which is rich in blue light. And at uh, 5,600, it's more reddish yellow. Um, so, you know, you can sort of choose sort of the impression that you want to give the, the viewer of your photo uh, and the mood, you know, that that photo gives uh, by sort of adjusting the white balance a little bit. Uh, Sten, can I interrupt you very quickly? Um, could sure. you actually share this as a uh, slide sh slideshow? So at the bottom of your screen, pressing that uh, button right next to the Zoom. Like that? There you go. Yeah, I think that might make it easier for people to read. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. I was trying to figure out how to do that. <laughs> okay. So um, here we have another example of white balance applied to you know, a, a set of photographs, uh, sort of more extreme, up to uh, 10,000 K Kelvin degrees. Uh, again, you know, it, it all has to do with what the effect is that you want to, to bring to your, your image. If you want it to be a warmer effect, you can go with the uh, lower temperatures. If you want it to be a hotter, perhaps a bit more stark and chilling effect, you can give a, a higher temperature. Um, of course, a lot of this astronomical photography really can't be done properly at low light levels unless you have a way of stabilizing uh, your camera. Uh, this is true for all kinds of astrophotography. Um, there are a couple of ways to do this. Uh, uh, some cameras have a voice control, which lets you um, basically tell the camera when to start an exposure and when to stop it. Uh, or you can use an app that gives a shooting delay 
where you dial in uh, three seconds and then when you push the expose button on your camera, uh, the camera waits three seconds before it actually takes the exposure. Um, this allows any vibrations to settle down, whether they are from your tripod wobbling or, or any other way that you're trying to stabilize the image uh, mechanically. Uh, for voice control, uh, you have to go in and, and set this up in the camera settings, uh, <clears throat> you know, to enable voice commands. And uh, that's uh, this uh, second panel here, shooting methods, it says voice commands, and you can, you know, uh, take pictures by saying cheese or capture or shoot uh, to start the exposure. Um, and, you know, there, you just have to sort of look at this feature, you know, for voice control because no, no smartphones, you know, do it quite the same way. So you have to figure out <laughs> what your camera is doing. Uh, there's also a shooting delay thing, which is, uh, you know, a, a, a mechanical thing that you can set up. It's a, a slider, as you see in the lower right corner of the, the image, it says uh, timer off. And if you enable a 10 second delay, which is shown by the blue arrow, then it will wait 10 seconds after you push the expose button before it actually takes the exposure. That's more than enough time <laughs> to settle down the, uh, the uh, camera and the tripod. So you get perfectly crisp, clear images and not things that are distorted by being smeared out. Uh, there's also this issue <clears throat> Uh, just about every smartphone, uh, once you've taken that exposure, will basically create a JPEG image and then put that in, you know, in an appropriate folder on your camera or on your smartphone. Uh, there's also a raw image format that you can enable, and raw image formats provide you basically all of the information that was gathered in that photograph. Uh, it doesn't do you know, any estimation, it doesn't do any processing on the image at all. It gives you the raw information, uncompressed. Uh, these tend to be fairly large files. If you're running a, a JPEG image that's a, a couple of megabytes in size uh, for the size, resolution that you're using, the corresponding raw image might be 15 to 20 megabytes in size. So. The advantage is that raw images, uh, when they are ingested by the appropriate post-processing program, allow you a lot more flexibility in, in how you change the quality of the image, change the brightness of the image, uh, change the color temperatures, and everything else. Um, so, you know, if you're a quote-unquote professional <laughs> astrophotographer, you almost always shoot with the raw image format. But you know, if you're the average person trying to snap a really cool picture, you know, of, of something that you saw in the sky and submit that, by all means, use the JPEG format. You know, it's it's universally used. Uh, you can still do a whole lot of work on it. Of course, the problem with JPEG is that uh, once it's in that format, you'll notice that when you zoom in on stars. Uh, they start looking kind of distorted or other other objects in the field. That's because the compression algorithm basically is subtracting information out of the real image to give you only the essential information about where things are and, and what shape they have. Uh, the raw image doesn't do that. It'll give you everything that, that came in through the lens of the camera for the most part uh, in, in all three of the uh, uh, the bands. So you can actually operate with each of the three bands independently, which is something you can't do with the JPEG image because it's all munched together into a unified RBG image. Um, so anyway, that's, that's my comments about raw images. Uh, where to find all of these controls? Uh, again, it sort of depends on the camera app that you're using. Uh, many native camera apps, that is the, the uh, cameras that come with your phone, uh, have nowadays some fairly powerful modes uh, that uh, you, can, you can use and, and engage. Um, uh, night mode and, and others allow you to uh, select whether you want to photograph star, star trails, <laughs> uh, the Milky Way, uh, and other things. And once you enable that function on your tripod with the camera, 
uh, it'll just automatically take as many images as it needs and process those internally using an AI algorithm to give you a final image of the Milky Way <laughs> or you know whatever it is it is that you've selected from the menu in the camera. Uh, camera Plus is a, a good app uh, that uh, is shown, the typical screen is shown on the left here. Uh, Open Camera is another app that's uh, also free and it's shown on the right. Uh, and you can access the exposure speed and ISO manual selections, uh, you know, as the yellow arrows indicate. Um, so it's, it's fairly intuitive how this all operates. So the basic settings for astrophotography, well, you know, it's, it's, it's going to depend on a, a lot of factors, of course. You know, if you're photographing during twilight time or at midnight, you're going to have a different set of, you know, sort of exposure speeds and things. Typically, you want to set your camera at infinity focus. Um, probably want to set your exposure time to the maximum that's available. Uh, for smartphone cameras under manual control, the maximum is about 32 seconds. Uh, and adjust your ISO accordingly so that you get the least amount of graininess in your final image. So, you know, if you do an, an, an ISO value of, of 1600, you can shoot 15 to 20 second images okay and not see much graininess and you'll get an awful lot of stars. Uh, if you shoot at 3200 ISO, uh, but decide to shoot only a couple of seconds, you'll see a lot of graininess. Um, so you, you have to decide what effect you want uh, in your final image. Uh, and choose your exposure speed and ISO accordingly. Again, uh, it behooves you to do a lot of experimentation. Uh, and so this is, this is not your typical point and shoot activity with a smartphone camera. <laughs> uh, th this actually requires some amount of thoughtfulness and really deeply understanding the functionality of the particular camera app you're using. Uh, what you'll need in the field, <laughs> uh, certainly a, an external battery pack, uh, you know, if you're planning on being out there and shooting a lot of images, um, you'll need warm clothes. It gets cold even in the summer, depending on where you are. Uh, flashlights and batteries, a red color filter for the flashlights, uh, so you don't crash your night vision by using an LED flashlight. <laughs> That's a bad combination. Uh, something to sit on helps because while your camera is taking its long exposures, I mean, you can either stand around and, uh, you know, you know, do whatever, or you can sit on something and, and read the daily paper under a red light. <laughs> um, you need a way to stabilize your phone. The recommended thing is using a, a tripod, a camera tripod with a smartphone adapter. Uh, typically, you can get camera tripods for Ten to fifteen dollars, and you can get the adapter for your smartphone for another five to ten. Um, those are well worth your your um, sort of effort to get, uh, unless you're planning on shooting mostly during the twilight conditions uh, when there's still plenty of light, you know, and you use uh, some of the other functionality of your camera to get that really nice moonrise image of the full moon coming up over a skyscraper or uh, even in the broad daylight, I mean, you might try your hand at shooting sunrise over some particular monument or alignment, you know, that's significant to you. I mean, there are many photos of people photographing the solstice sunrise uh, uh, at Stonehenge or some other combination of, of landmarks. Uh, even New York City has an avenue uh, where the sun rises, the sun rises directly at the bottom of that street, uh, Manhattan, at uh, the spring equinox, and so people flock into that intersection just to see sunrise going down this canyon of skyscrapers. I mean, there are all kinds of possible astrophotography subjects you can think of, and you're encouraged to think as broadly as you can. Um, Oh yeah, uh, one thing that I didn't mention is uh, you know getting permissions. You know, if, if you're going to really go someplace where you want to photograph a particular monument or be in the dark sky area, 
a lot of these areas are, are privately owned. And so you need to get permissions from the landowners or, or whatever the agency is that grants permission for people to come onto that property. Uh, without that, you could wind up in a lot of trouble. Uh, let me just put it in those terms. Uh, you also, when you're out there doing astrophotography in a rural or a, a natural environment, you really need to maintain uh, environmental consciousness. That is to say, you need to know what's going on around you at all times. I mean, you don't want a bear sneaking up on you while you're looking through the finder of your camera setting up a shot of the Milky Way. That would be a very bad thing to have happen. So you need situational awareness, awareness of where you are and what kinds of hazards uh, are around you uh, at all times. Okay. Um, Many things you know, come into the consideration of what to photograph uh, and how to set up the photograph. Uh, you know, if you're an artist, you already know how to do this. If you're a professional photographer, you're well-versed in, in how to frame a subject. Uh, the challenge in astrophotography is to pick a subject that represents itself as, as well as possible with a smartphone type technology with a fixed small lens <laughs> of limited uh, resolution. Um, so you need to understand, you know, not only your subject, but also whether or not your smartphone can rise to meet the challenge of photographing that subject under the light conditions that you're selecting. Of course, you want to know what the weather is like. Uh, it's not fun to photograph in, under rainy conditions. Although I have seen some really dramatic photographs of uh, thunderstorms in the distance with the Milky Way above the clouds. So, you know, I mean, we're not gonna throw out that as a possibility too. You know, you just don't want your equipment, which is expensive to get rained on. Um, and, you know, you also need to understand what kinds of objects are going to be up in the sky at the time that you're doing your photography. And so planning your your shoot in advance is, is really an art form. Uh, the sky changes just about every night and every time of the evening, it's, it's a slightly different uh, constellation pattern and orientation of the Milky Way and different times of the years have opportunities for different planets to be up in the sky. And of course, there's the moon, you know, which goes about its, its own business <laughs> every month. So you'll have phases of the moon to contend with. You know, if you want to do uh, faint star photography, it's probably not a good idea to select a time around the full moon uh, because the light pollution from the full moon is likely to swamp just about any combination of ISO and exposure speeds you, you want to use. Um, let's see. A, a number of suggestions for a, a, a quote, good picture. Uh, in, in Typical photography, you, you use what's called the rule of thirds. You break your scene up into you know, nine <laughs> uh, squares or rectangles. And basically, the, the idea is that you want the subject matter of interest to be behind either one of the vertical lines you see here or the other. So it's in one part of the third space or it's in the other part of the third space. You know, rarely do you want your, your primary subject matter to be smack in the middle of the picture. Although, depending on what your circumstance is, you might not have a whole lot of choice in, in where your object appears. Because, for instance, if you move it to the camera too far to the right, there might be a bright street light that will then intrude on your scene. <laughs> if you move it too far to the left, there might be the security light from your neighbor's house intruding on the scene in that direction. So. You know, you're, you're kind of limited in, in how you can frame things, but certainly the foreground, you know, whether the, the lower third of the image contains uh, lights from distant houses or a distant city or clouds, you know, that, that's certainly a possible thing to include uh, in, your, in your compositing of the image. Uh, photographing the moon, uh, I'm going to talk about some specific objects now. Photographing the moon 
uh, can be disappointing with a smartphone camera that doesn't have a, a at least a 10x or a 16x zoom attachment. Uh, because basically you're not going to see any craters. Um, all you're going to do is to see some of the large dark mare, uh, the, the dark splotches that you see in this photo. Uh, and the, the challenge is to make sure that the, the, the limb of the moon is properly focused. So that's often the challenge in photographing the moon. Make sure that you know, the, the part of the moon you're interested in is bright enough that you can actually focus on it. Otherwise, everything gets blurry and, and kind of uninteresting. It's very easy to take a blurry picture of the moon. <laughs> take it from me as an expert in taking those kinds of pictures. Um, usually, you know, if you take your the 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 autofocus basically is a feature in your camera that looks at certain pixels and puts a box around where it's going to be primarily focusing. And if you put that box across the, the limb of the moon, the limb of the moon should have a nice crisp edge. So that's usually a good place where you put your autofocus. Don't, don't put it on one of the mare because they're blurry and you're not gonna get a good, good result. So put it right on the edge of the moon and uh, things should turn out uh, pretty well. Um, you know, there, there are a variety of, of things you can try to do. You can try using the, the night mode on the camera to automatically take pictures of things. Uh, make sure that the foreground is interesting. In this case, you have some really lovely, well-focused uh, tree shadows uh, during this uh, particular conjunction. Um, and so that's, that's a thing to consider when you're framing an image. Uh, conjunctions, well, they don't happen very often. Uh, and so you, you're gonna have to look at your Almanac or your um, Sky Simulator app, Planetarium app, to see what's available during the time when you're gonna be photographing, uh, just to see what the universe is providing, with, providing you. Uh, Milky Way and constellations are always fun to photograph. That's one of the first things that, that I do when I get a new camera, is I go out in my backyard, set up my tripod, point the camera at the sky and take some series of exposures up to 30 seconds long at different ISOs. And then I basically look at the images on my laptop to see just how well the camera performs. Uh, when I got my first camera, which was an, an, an iPhone 6S, <laughs> it, you know, you, you'd look at the constellation Orion and you'd see basically two stars in the constellation and a very grainy background sky. So, you know, I decided that that particular technology, which is now eight, nine, 10 years old, <laughs> wasn't gonna work very well. Uh, but my new camera does extremely well. It's just a joy to use. Um, and uh, you can now sort of do a lot of fancy photographs like the one on the left here, uh, which is fairly easy to do. Uh, and there are actually functionalities within some of these native cameras on the higher end smartphones that say, Photograph the Milky Way or photograph star trails. And it will do uh, the, it'll take a series of uh, a dozen or so exposures. It'll throw out the bad ones. It'll do what's called flat fielding and uh, other kinds of correction algorithms to give you the crispest looking image from that particular uh, stack of images. And you're almost never disappointed. Uh, but Again, you need a dark sky situation. You need a really dark site in order to make that really happen. Star trails, uh, basically you need to photograph, you know, dozens and dozens of images at, you know, up to 30 seconds per image, and then you combine them uh, post-processing to produce these trailed images. Uh, or some camera apps actually have this functionality in them already. So you just say, I wanna do a star trail, push the button, and then you walk away and let the camera sit there for a couple of hours doing its thing. Uh, meteor showers are, you know, they come and go. You know, if there's one schedule at the time that you're viewing, then they're almost always worth uh, worthwhile to try to photograph. It's the same thing as photographing constellations. You know, long exposures, uh, at high ISO numbers, you know, in order to catch these very fleeting faint things. Uh, you can do aurora photography. In many cases, you don't even need a tripod for some of these. 
Uh, the summer is not a good time to see aurora because uh, you know we've got the midnight sun and we've got uh, you know very light skies. So the winter months uh, are generally the best for aurora. And so it's, but you know, this is offered as sort of a possibility for those of you that might be in places where you can see aurora. <laughs> uh, worth worth going after, and they almost never disappoint. Uh, lunar and solar eclipses, uh, they're a matter of, uh, you know, what's available. There are a couple available uh, for you to try your hand at. <clears throat> lunar eclipses are a lot of fun. You just take a series of uh, photos uh, between first contact and last contact and totality, and you'll get a nice sequence that way. Similarly for solar eclipses, but generally you have to be along the path of totality to make solar eclipses look well. Otherwise, you're going to have to take solar eclipses through a filter, like the one at the top, showing a very orange <laughs> sun with the filtered light. Uh, Time-lapse uh, photos are also possible, where you stack a, lo a lot of images together, and then you combine them into a movie. And there's uh, usually a built-in photo camera app that'll do that for you, uh, like time-lapse or, or something else. There are many of these available. Uh, panoramas are, are fun and challenging to do. Uh, it's like, uh, you know, taking a panorama in the daytime. Uh, you just uh, basically do it slightly differently for the nighttime objects. You segment the field into a bunch of individual exposures. And then post-processing, you combine those individual ones into one common one by looking at reference stars in the overlapping areas and getting those to line up properly. Uh, so anyway, pro tips, there are a lot of them, but uh, select the highest ISO number that doesn't produce graininess. Uh, exposure is more than one second. You should use a tripod. Modern smartphones, uh, you know, let you use uh, one 10 second exposures and ISOs longer than 800. Uh, and that's uh, usually sufficient to capture all the naked eye stars you can see in formatting. Uh, but you know, in addition to these these night these nighttime photos, you know, do consider daytime photos as well. The alignments of the rising sun over particular landmarks are always fun to go after. If you happen to have a birthday during the time of uh, this competition, you know, try to find some interesting landmark, <laughs> you know, a building or set of buildings, and see if you can line things up so that uh, the sun rises over this at the time of your birthday. Um, there are a number of useful apps uh, for post-processing the data, and they're, they're, they're used by, by many of us. Uh, you'll have to decide which ones for the particular project you're undertaking are going to be the best. Um, Snapseed is one that, uh, that is used by, by many of us. It uses the raw file and allows you to prop, prop data and, and change responsivity curves and uh, sharpness and do, do a lot of different type of masking to bring out details. Uh, stacking is a very common technique post-processing. Uh, you take images and you stack them one on top of the other and that averages away uh, the background to make it look darker and darker the more images you take. It also lets you dig deeper into the fainter objects in the sky that you might not see in one image but will start revealing themselves after you've stacked uh, tens or hundreds of these images together. This is often how some of the most spectacular Milky Way shots are. are. Um, that, um, that, here's just a montage of possibilities, you know, to, to, to whet your appetite. And I think that basically concludes my, my little um, session here. So thank you very much for attending and um, I'll, Pass it back over to Kelly. <laughs> Thank you for that. That was really great. So what we're going to do now, we're going to take a 10 minute break. Um, I'm going to share my screen so that we can just keep track of where we are um, on the live stream. And uh, if you're still with us, uh, thank you for sticking around. We're going to uh, take a 10 minute break and then come back and do a Q&A. So please think of those questions and put them in the chat and we will uh, come back shortly to, uh, to address them. Uh, so thank you and see you soon.
All right, everyone, we're going to get started. Um, I'm going to actually stop sharing my screen so that I can have a full on conversation with Sten um, instead of staring into the corner over here. All right. Um, well, thank you again for being here. Uh, we have a bunch of questions that came from the chat. Um, and to give some people a little bit more time to think about what they might want to ask. Um, and as these questions come through, um, I'm actually going to ask a few that were asked yesterday at the the previous um, uh, the the previous workshop. Um, so the first one, very simply, is um, how did you get into astrophotography, uh, and um, how did you specifically get into astrophotography with your phone? Well, I, I wasn't joking when I talked about when dinosaurs ruled the earth. I mean, I started <laughs> I, I started astrophotography when I was like 10 or 11 years old back in the 60s. But way back in the Stone Age, uh, not only did you have to build your own telescope, but you had to develop your own film. So by the time I was in middle school, I was really good at developing black and white film in my closet. <laughs> with my dog outside trying to get in all the time. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I got my a tripod from a secondhand store. I, I bought a single lens reflex film camera at a flea market tag sale in Alameda, California. And uh, I just started experimenting, taking um, long photos of the night sky. Of course, it was under urban conditions, with a lot of light pollution. But I was also a Boy Scout, so occasionally I'd get out into the countryside with the dark skies. And while everybody else was sleeping to get ready for the next day's activity, I would stay up until one in the morning, annoying people, you know, with my flashlights and taking photographs and using up rolls of film. Um, I put all of that away when I went to college and graduate school and got into my profession. But uh, I kind of recovered it when I started, uh, like everybody else, buying smartphones. And uh, I decided, well, you know, let's see how good they are because they seem to be pretty good cameras. And I was pretty surprised, especially with the more recent ones. Uh, and I was sufficiently surprised that I actually, <laughs> as they say, I wrote a book on the subject, <laughs> which is available at NASA, you know, free of charge as a PDF file. Um, and so that's that's it. It was sort of like a lifelong thing with a big interruption for everything else. But I actually have come back full circle to the same intriguing challenges. Um, that's that's really interesting that the the journey that you went on to to come back to astrophotography. That's really I'm glad you found it again because we're very happy to have you here. Um, now, uh, without you know naming a specific brand or a producer or anything like that, what are the best qualities that people should look for in smartphones um, when it comes to uh, doing astrophotography with their phone? Well, I I think the the biggest tip off on on smartphones is if if they boast that they can photograph under faint light levels, then that's probably a good place to start. Uh, most smartphones, uh, you know, that have come out, well, before about three or four years ago, you know, they, they were not all that good for very faint light level photography. I mean, my first attempts were with, uh, as I said, an iPhone 6S, which were abysmal. And then I upgraded to uh, a Galaxy uh, 8 and a Galaxy 9. And those worked uh, extremely well at night. I mean, I could get photographs of, uh, you know, faint stars and everything else. And it had enough functionality that I could do a really good job with stacking and, and, and getting real, real decent images. Uh, the modern cameras, however, are even better than that. You know, they've got much better uh, sensors that can respond to even lower levels of light. So you don't have to keep pushing the ISO numbers up to get the effect you want, you can just sort of use the intrinsic quantum efficiency of, of the camera to, you know, help you through most of this. So yeah, um, it, it's always the case that the better models are better than the older models, <laughs> even in astrophotography. That is unfortunately, I guess, 
That is the that is the way of technology, I suppose. Um, most of the time, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we have a bunch of questions from from folks who are watching us live, which is really great. Um, mm -hmm. Someone's asked about temperature limitations for your phone and for the camera on your phone. Um, I, I think it was partially answered uh, by another person who was watching um, live, but uh, I wonder if, if you have anything that you'd like to add about that. Uh, well, I mean, the, the temperature limitation, it mostly seems to impact the, the amount of charge that your battery maintains under really cold condition, your your batteries, you know, tend to run out more quickly. I I don't understand the, the physics. <laughs> I'm an astrophysicist. I study cosmology. I don't study, you know, small things and devices. But uh, you know, generally, my experience has been with the older phones that uh, I mean, I could stay out with these phones under you know 40 degree conditions and and spend a couple of hours out there with them without any apparent difficulties. You know, clearly you don't want to be in Antarctica at 40 below because I don't even think anything works under those conditions. But, you know, use, I mean, use some reasonable judgment about, you know, where you're going to be shooting. Um, yes, that makes lots of sense. And I suppose um, the manufacturer will have some information about the, the limitations as well. Yeah. So that's probably something good to check also. In, um, in the older model phones that, that had the, you know, that that were lower quality <laughs> because of the evolution of technology, uh, you know, you could point the phones directly at the sun and not burn out, you know, the camera. And many, many people took photographs of the sun rising over their, you know, favorite landmarks. And you'd see a burned out image of the sun as a disc in the sky, you know, with a big halo and that was okay for that camera. It didn't damage the, the sensor. Um, I, as a rule, would not do that with, with the more modern cameras. Um, because the, the problem is that you might not burn out the sensor, but you might damage the sensor so that it has a memory of the sun having been illuminating those pixels. Mm. And that means that any future photograph you take will have some kind of a blemish at that location. Um, I haven't tested this out rigorously, but I'm not about to try with my new thousand dollar smartphone to see if it <laughs> sustains the sun, <laughs> you know, at full, full volume. Uh, the sun over the horizon, you know, in the twilight kind of city situation is perfectly fine. But, you know, I wouldn't, and I don't know why you would photograph the noonday sun, you know, unless you, I don't know. There might don't, be a reason, but don't do don't it. Don't <laughs> do anything that seems to be an unreasonable thing. I mean, smartphones <laughs> are not infinitely hardy and, you know, can survive anything. You know, you just drop them on the floor and they break. So if you put enough photons through that lens, that little teeny lens, you know, you'll likely do some kind of damage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. They're not invincible. That's for, that's nope. for sure. Um. There's uh, another question that we have about editing raw photos. Um, do you have any suggestions for good free editing apps for raw photos? Uh, frankly, to be perfectly candid with you, I haven't spent a lot of time with uh, raw data, raw image data. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I haven't really experimented very much with that. There are, there are others in this lecture series that, that have done extensive work using raw images. Uh, I've tried a few times the, the you know, the, you know, the, uh, the benefits seem to be there. You know, I just wasn't particularly clever in, in availing myself, either having the right software or being clever enough to do something with it. But uh, perhaps, you know, with a little bit of study and Googling, you'll, you'll find out what you need to know. It's not hard to get this information. Um, you know, it, it really isn't. <clears throat> and actually what we're going to be doing, so if you signed up, uh, for those of you who are viewing us live, if you signed up uh, through the Eventbrite link, um, if you registered with us there, uh, then I have your contact information and I will send you um, a document that we're preparing that has all of the information from this workshop with extra resources so you can learn about thing, things mm -hmm. like um, uh, uh, processing raw images. Um, so 
please go to the Eventbrite link um, that we'll put in the chat, uh, probably close to the end of this session, um, and we'll make sure that you have uh, all of that information. Yeah, you, you see, the, the thing is that when you have an astronomer doing astrophotography, as a professional astronomer, I can get access to images that are far better than what my smartphone camera can provide. So why would I waste my time? Because it's fun. I know, but <laughs> what is really fun is, is using low tech, you know, using your smartphone with maybe Photoshop or your native, you know, image processing thing that you get you know, through Microsoft and using that software. I mean, for me, I, I tend to be more interested in the foreground framing in an interesting way than I am really in, in, in how deep I can integrate the Milky Way in the sky. Because as I said, if I want that effect, I'll get the professional to show me an image. I mean, you know, I'm pretty lazy that way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there know. is something to be said for images taken from- Hubble. Uh, Hubble, JWST, any yes, of those. Yes, yes, yes. I've been totally spoiled, you know. <laughs> um, but for those of us who are <laughs> interested and, and excited about uh, taking photos on the ground um, with what we can ha have in our pocket, uh, this, this is a, a fun conversation. So um, we have a couple more questions. Let's see. Uh, one of them we're actually going to talk about uh, at the end of this talk, at the end of the event. So I'm not going to talk about that question right now. Um, uh, maybe, so uh, we showed some uh, images of what the screen looks like for um, uh, changing the ISO um, and yeah. changing uh, various different um, mm -hmm. uh, parameters uh, about taking mm -hmm. a photo. Um, but uh, it Turns out that the uh, some people are having some issue in finding those features on the Camera Plus app. Um, do mm -hmm. you know of any other apps that are useful that are maybe also free um, that people can use to take photos uh, with their phone and change these different parameters? Uh, off the top of my head, no, I don't. I don't. Uh, you just simply have to hunt around. Um, that. When I wrote the book, I wrote it like three, four years ago. And since then, there are dozens of more camera apps that have come out there that are probably more popular. And I haven't really had a chance to test drive them. But uh, generally, you know, if you have the right app, there'll be either a cog wheel or some other icon that you tap that will open up the manual mode. You just have to keep poking around on your camera face <laughs> until you find the icon that gets you to that, that functionality. Um, if you run out of icons and you still don't find it, that generally means that the app doesn't have it. <laughs> uh, that'll be a very good clue. Um, so yeah, just you know, just poke at everything. I mean, that's what my, my, my teenage kids do, you know, when they're learning something, they just poke everything until they see something interesting, <laughs> you know? And I, I think it works here. You have to be, you, you have to be aggressive in seeking out the knowledge that you want. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, well, we have a number of questions about raw images, but I think I'm gonna leave those to um, maybe the the resource document that I send out uh, to everybody that registered with us. Um, yeah. Well, uh, if yeah. you want to hear me give progressively more denials that I know anything about them, I can do that <laughs> if you'd like, but that seems to be a waste of time. <laughs> maybe let's avoid that for now, but we can come back to it if we feel like it later. Um, uh, so let's see. Uh, Okay, so I, I think we actually will get to, to this at the end of this session, but um, could you maybe give uh, your opinion on using astrophotography for um, astronomy and science and maybe in astronomy education? Oh, oh my gosh. Um, the, you know, there are a lot of interesting citizen science projects that, that are available that involve astrophotography. The one that I'm most familiar with is one that I've, I've been running for a while. And that is, uh, you know, you're all familiar with the uh, SpaceX uh, Starlink satellites. And you've probably heard that 
their streaks across the sky are really damaging things the same way that light pollution does. Um, the citizen science project that I have basically is attempting to document the degradation of our early morning and late evening skies, you know, by these streaks. So it's um, a, a way of cataloging through smartphone images, well, also digital camera images, which have higher resolution, you know, just how bad things have gotten uh, over a, a fairly long length of time, like five to 10 years. So that's one thing. Um, you know, beyond that, smartphones, you know, are, are limited. They have very small lenses, uh, and uh, there's not a whole lot of, of research-grade astronomy you can do with them. But, you know, not everything that is meaningful in life necessarily is a research-grade activity. You know, I'd, I'd sort of recommend that you get your curiosity going, you know, about things that you wanted to explore and that this astrophotography might be a means to sort of understanding a phenomenon a little bit better. Like, you know, a very trivial example, taking uh, sequential images of the aurora borealis and watching how that changes over time from minute to minute to hour. Um, you know, there's always a lot of interest in that. And of course, there's a citizen science project called Aurorasaurus, which is very interested in, you know, lots of people keeping track of whether they can see Aurora from their location or not. Mm. That's very cool. I think um, someone mentioned it in the chat a little bit earlier in the, in the session, but um, uh, many of their students don't um, realize that the uh, azimuth of the sunrise and sunset changes with the season. Um, uh, so it would be really interesting actually to do maybe like a um, I think they suggested like a photo contest, but you could even do this within the context of your own um, uh, your own classroom, you know, mm -hmm. like have have a, a series of photos that your students take throughout the year that kind of yeah. demonstrate this back and forth motion of the sun. Well, even if you started right now, between now and the end of the competition, uh, that probably spans about a month or two in time. You know, you could get a sequence of, um, you know, the path of the moon across the sky, you know, uh, during nighttime, you know, or the elevation of the sun above the horizon. As we get towards summer, it gets higher and higher. You know, if you happen to be in a natural setting, you could, uh, you know, explore rising and setting positions of the sun or the moon, you know, and keep track of that through a sequence of photographs that you take. So, you know, there are a lot of these sorts of things that, that, well, quite frankly, people have paid attention to that for literally thousands of years. <laughs> so you're in very good company. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's true. There's a lot you can do in just a month or two. Even, even though you might know not a whole lot about raw images. <laughs> even though. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, we do, we have another question here about uh, f-stops. So uh, someone's f, uh, sorry, excuse me, someone's smartphone uh, allows them to change the f-stop from 10 to a very small number. Um, do you have a value that you would suggest? It probably depends on the object that you're looking at, I would assume. Oh, it, it definitely depends on the object. I mean, for, for, dim light and night sky things, you want the f-stop to be as small as possible. Do you want it to be like, you know, one or two or three, you know, whichever is available to you on your phone. Uh, for very bright things, you know, you can stop down your lens if you have that ability to like 10 to 15 and still have enough light to come in. But of course, you're going to lose, you know, definition and clarity on, on foreground things. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, it's a balance. Um, so, I mean, basically with ISO and with exposure speed, you already have two things to keep track of when you're setting up an exposure. You know, adding f-stop to that, you know, makes for a three-dimensional space of possibilities. It's very hard to search to find really the right combination for the particular image that you want to take. So I'm, I'm happy that smartphones basically are locked with their f-stop, and so I only have to worry about exposure and ISO, and maybe white balance if I'm daring. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's that's a very good point. It's a lot of 
things, a lot of moving parts to keep track of and make sure that um, they're operating the way you want them to. Yeah. I, I one of the um, uh, one of the other uh, people who helped to build this workshop actually suggested fiddling around with things, you know, turning off the all the lights in your room and trying to take a dark uh, uh, an image of an object that is very dark um, mm -hmm. and uh, kind of practicing with the balance of all of these parameters mm -hmm. together. And I think yeah. that, that sounds like a really, you know, fun way to yeah. figure out mm -hmm. how to use your phone um, in this yeah. way. Yeah, I mean, as with any instrument, it, it you get your, the best benefits if you know your instrument well. And the only way you do that is by just messing around with it, trying lots of different combinations and seeing which give you the ooh and ah effect. <laughs> You know, and and it and with photography, it, it all really depends on the subject matter too. So that's another variable you get to add to the mix. Mm, absolutely, mm -hmm. um, and just like an instrument, uh, practice makes you better. So, um, you know, you're not going to get it right first time or the second time. Well, <laughs> and, and with some scientific times. instruments, it's also the case that the more you know your instrument, the more confused you are by it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but uh, hey, that, that keeps us uh, on our toes. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, all right, so there are um, a number of questions that I have to address um, in the document that I share with everyone. So I am excited to dive into that. Um, I think we're reaching kind of a, um, a lull in the questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start sharing my screen and we'll do a little bit of a wrap up. Um, and we'll end the session for today. Um, but uh, Sten, I wanted to thank you again for being here with us. Um, we really appreciate um, all the time and effort you put into this. So thank well, you. Thank you very much. And if any of you are in the Kensington, Maryland area, we can all go out for a Starbucks. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Um, okay, great. So I'm sure that you all are just really itching to go outside and try this. Uh, for yourself. Um, but please just give me your attention for a few more moments and I'll wrap things up for you uh, and then send you on your way. Um, so there are a number of different ways that you can practice your skills um, and get recognized for it too. Uh, so Astronomers Without Borders has several photo campaigns throughout the year, um, including uh, Beauty Without Borders, which just uh, concluded actually. Um, it also has a, a sol sol solstice photo campaign um, and a number of other observing events where you can uh, practice your smartphone astrophotography skills. Um, so I'd encourage you to take a look at their website um, and check out what they have planned for the rest of the year. Um, uh, the International Dark Sky Association also has um, its own uh, astrophotography contest, uh, which is called Capture the Dark that features a mobile category. Um, uh, you might have meant, uh, or you might have heard, you might have caught that uh, uh, Sten mentioned a contest that we're talking about uh, within our context. Um, so there's also an astrophotography contest from the IAU Office of Astronomy for Education. Um, and this year we have a mobile category that's sponsored by the OAO. So that means that uh, for the winners of this category, six people will be awarded uh, 100 euros. Um, and there will be a number of honorable mentions as well. Um, and all once once all of the results are out, uh, likely later um, this year, perhaps uh, August or September, um, the OAO will host an e exhibition and gala for the winners to talk about their work um, and share uh, their uh, interaction with the night sky and what all of this means for them. Uh, so I hope that many of you who are tuning in today will participate uh, in this contest and then also participate in this e-exhibition and gala that we have uh, planned. Um, so we hope to see you again there. Um, like we talked about with Sten, um, in addition to being able to take beautiful photographs, your phone is actually a really powerful scientific tool. Um, and we encourage you to explore the world of citizen science. Um, I'm gonna mention a couple uh, uh, opportunities here, but there are many, many more. So please, um, you know, scour the internet for these opportunities. They're really, they're out there and they're just waiting for you, honestly. Um, so a really great example is Globe at Night, 
um, the Night Sky Light Pollution Project, which gathers light pollution data from around the world to understand how light pollution is changing and how we're affecting it. Um, so this is a really um, impactful project um, that I, I think was uh, even part of uh, uh, a project that was written about recently um, that showed that light pollution is increasing at a rate of 9% each year, um, which is really quite alarming. Um, so this is uh, an opportunity for you to get involved with something that is um, really changing the way that we see and interpret and understand light pollution. Um, another citizen pro science project uh, that Sten mentioned um, was the uh, Satellite Streak Watcher, um, which aims, like he said, to understand how the growing number of satellites in space impacts the viewing conditions here on Earth. Um, and though, so with that, I would just like to thank you for your time and thank you for your attention. Um, thank you for uh, joining us here. Uh, Please go out and take photos uh, and then tag us in them. Tag the OAO, tag uh, AWB, our partners in this in the, this workshop. Um, and we are uh, very excited to see what you come up with, um, to see the images that you take. Um, please participate in the, um, the astrophotography uh, competitions, all of them, if you can. I think that would be fantastic. Um, but particularly for us, we would, of course, like you to uh, engage in ours. Um, so uh, uh, also there's the um, uh, Dark and Quiet Skies project that we're, we have for the entire month of May. And we have a lot of other projects and events lined up for this month. So please uh, take a look at that information. And I think those links are now in the chat. Um, thank you to my helper who is here uh, to, uh, to, to put all of that information into the chat for you guys. Um, so uh, thank you again for uh, being a part of this. Um, if you registered with the Eventbrite link, again, I'm going to be, be sending you some more information uh, to follow up and give you a little bit more of a guide, a written guide about how to do astrophotography with your phone. Um, if you didn't sign up with the Eventbrite link, you still can, uh, and the uh, link should be in the chat now. Um, so uh, you can take a look at that and uh, sign up, and then we'll have um, we'll, we'll be in contact. Uh, and I'd like to thank Sten again, uh, for being here with us. Um, and, uh, I hope you all have a lovely rest of your day or evening or whatever it may be.